All right, so hello everyone. My name is Holtzman, uh, or Patrick Casey in the professional world. Uh, I am an ex-Destiny YouTuber, current Destiny YouTuber now, because I'm making this video. So what we're going to do, since this piece of content is put, being put into the vault, we're going to run through it, and we're going to talk with uh, Datto here, and then we're going to talk with Viper here uh, about some of the stuff that's going on in the mission. Uh, Datto, why would we be talking to you about this? Uh, you know, that's a really good question, and I'm going to answer your question with another question. Why, why did you bring me here? Uh, you know what? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say the video will probably do a lot better on YouTube if I put your name in the title and you show up. In I 100% respect it. Uh, Viper, why why do you think I asked you here? Uh, you asked me here because I designed this and I'm gonna talk about what what I did and choices I made and inside uh, info. Yeah, inside info. Talk about the development a little bit. I'm having to redo this because I forgot to press record last time and we got like a, a, enough of a, way, of a way through that we had a rhythm going and now we're, we're redoing this. It might now show up in the Square one. Square one. Nice. Anyway. Nice. So the first time I ever did this, uh, I was put in like a playtest lab with this guy sitting behind me uh, and I, I was just dropped into this lost sector right here and I started going through it. And he's like, yeah, just let me know, uh, let me know what's going through your mind. And I was like, well, I'm in a lost sector. And at the time, there were a bunch of enemies in here. And I was like, well, yeah, this is, this is just a lost sector. What the, what's the big deal with it? And I was going in through, killing enemies, made it through to the end, looted the chest. I, that was it. I was like, all right, so there's something else here. What's going on, Viper? How come there's no like enemies in here now? Yeah. So actually, that's a really good point. You just reminded me. I think it was you guys it was uh you and i'm i'm assuming it was also merc and uh uh rathona that was probably the initial feedback and the choice of like why i decided to pull the enemies out and force them to not spawn in this version of the lost sector was because i wanted players to not get distracted by that combat to notice that some things were different so those things that are different are there's a timer uh, there is an absence of enemies when normally you would you know players who are experienced which is very specifically who we were targeting as the audience was experienced players. This was a really a love letter to, to destiny players uh, as a destiny player myself. I wanted to make something that really helped show that there's magic in this game. There's secrets. There's something hidden around every corner and setting it up this way really pulled those distractions back. So like you were describing, you know, you, you kill all the guys and then looted the chest. I wanted to, to make something different that wasn't too on the nose. Mm -hmm. So just pulling all that combat out was it. And then uh, encouraging exploration, putting a wall in front of the the uh, transition, the the hallway that sends you back out into uh, Lost Oasis. Dado, what the hell did you think, Dado, the first time you actually walked into here? Um, I don't think I was like one of the absolute first people to come in here and be like, uh, what the hell's going on? So by the time i was actually like stepping in here finally i think this kind of little taken ball thing mm -hmm. right here was kind of solved already and people were literally already figuring out a way to jump from the ground all the way up here without having to run through <laughs> the entire wall sector so that's just kind of what i ended up doing for the uh for the first run that i ever ended up doing i, I do like how the community kind of optimized that that route too like it's such a simple thing of oh yeah they like in development, they probably knew to jump like from here to here to there, but nah, in, in development, like I think I had like one of the faster routes. Uh, I think on... you're the guy who actually figured out hop on the rock, hop on the shell, yeah. and then I, jump across that. Because originally, I, I want to say you showed me that, and I was uh, like, oh, you can go that way. Yeah, originally, mine was like jump here and then jump up to like here. And mm -hmm. then jump uh, across over to there, but then uh, I guess at some point I did the I did the rock one. I was like, oh shit, no, that's that's way easier. All right, so let's let us let us go through let's go through here. Wonder bar. Well, skeleton stories. <laughs> you got any, uh, uh, so any stories? I'll, about I'll explain that. Yeah, yeah. the uh, the art director, um, my my partner in crime, working on this, uh, Rob. He. He's really big on this concept of skeleton stories. So all mm -hmm. these dead Vex he were, are purposefully placed here as a, a, a way to do some environmental storytelling. So having the player look at these corpses and sort of imagine like, what were these guys doing in here? It just, it gets the player's mind thinking about that as opposed to just leaving it empty without any skeletons. 
So that's that's what skeleton stories means. Uh, same with like this guy who's reaching down for you. That's very mm -hmm. purposefully placed that way, mm -hmm. so that you have that that idea of like, oh, you know, you might grab me. Oh no, as I slide through the gap, right? Like <laughs> yeah. it's silly, but yeah. So those are skeleton stories. Oh man! And then just like when you first come into here, and you're like, oh, oh, th this is something different. Yeah, this big reveal moment uh, was something that. I talked about heavily with Rob and I, you know, I, I got to give him the credit for that. Like just really executing on it was, mm -hmm. was perfect. Like the first, the first reveal that he showed me, which was coming through there and noticing that everything's off kilter was, it was perfect. He just nailed it off the first shot. So yeah. that was super great. Uh, the, the sense we were really going for in here with everything being at a slight angle is a feeling of instability. And he and I talked about, um, different real life experiences that sort of give you that sense mm -hmm. of like delving into the unknown. And for me, I, I always told him that I think the best way for me to think about it was uh, at Disneyland in uh, Anaheim, they have Tom Sawyer's Island. Uh -huh. And when you go into the cave in Tom Sawyer's Island, the floor, it looks flat, but you're actually at an angle. So as a person experiencing this part of the attraction, it makes you feel this sense of vertigo and imbalance. And uh, I, I feel like, again, uh, Rob just nailed that feeling with all these sharp angles and the weird ledges and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. yeah, no, that's why we went in that direction. One thing I've always said about Destiny that I've always really, really enjoyed is that I think Destiny is at its best when it gets to show off how big it is. Like yeah. when, when I get to feel like, small small player big world that's like some of the best feeling uh some of the best feelings that i get playing this game is just like being this tiny tiny little guy in this massive massive environment just because you know th this is one of the biggest ones uh that i feel like we've had and you know it really makes you feel like a tiny little nothing totally agree with you there um the choices to make this this big cavernous space open up, uh, it was very purposeful, and you're you're absolutely right on that. We took a lot of inspiration from uh, Vault of Glass. Like for us, we wanted mm -hmm. to make players feel that same feeling, that sense of scale, as like the world falls away from you with that big reveal. There were those moments in Vault of Glass as you come across, like you know, you're kind of going through this like tight little cavern and then it opens up and then you have this huge drop and you don't know if you're going to die but you have to you know you, you just take this leap of faith and that's kind of right that's exactly what we were going for here like we're inside of what seems like the planet right now it's it's tough to get a much better grand scale sort of opportunity than that i feel like absolutely um the some of the uh I don't know what the right word is. Inspiration, I guess, that I tried to give Rob was uh, for the environment was imagine that you're you're kind of diving into these disused lava tubes of of IO, mm. and you want to know what's in there, right? So as you get in there, you realize like, oh, I'm not just in lava tubes. There's this crazy vex machine. Like I don't even understand how does this even exist under here, and it's been under my feet this whole time while I'm running around on the surface of IO. I was super into that. Uh, I thought that was a really cool mental place to be. Yeah. I, one of the things I like about just this, the section in general uh, is like how lost you can easily get. I remember the first, like the first time I ran through it, it took me like a good five minutes to get through to where we're at right now. And like, I ended up jumping from, instead of like jumping down to the correct way, I went like around this area over there uh, instead of going, uh, following the red light, so to speak. And then when I got over here, I was I, I just kept going this way. Uh, oh well, yeah, that's a super bait. I'm sure very intentionally designed to be a absolutely. giant bait. Yes, it totally was. We uh, we we drew this up because um, we were sketching out different ideas for. I think we called them like we didn't we didn't even come up with a word for it, but like tricks or false paths. Uh, because again, that that ties back into that Tom Sawyer's Island concept. Um, having something that sort of like leads you in one way, but as you get there, you're like, wait a minute, this doesn't seem right. Uh, and we used a lot of lighting. Uh, mm -hmm. I should say Rob used a lot of lighting to, to capitalize on that and really sell that feeling. So if you notice, everywhere the player is sort of supposed to be or where they're supposed to go, it's red. Mm -hmm. Everything else is cyan, and that's 100% on purpose. 
the cyan tone is meant to give you that sense of volume and feeling and it's cool and color theory works in certain ways where like a cooler sense makes people feel differently than a hotter sense which would be the red color so using the red to really guide the player was was purposeful mm -hmm. and yeah this false path turned into that um that scene our, our concept for this was that scene in uh, lord of the rings where they're like walking through the mountain pass before they decide to go into the mines of moria uh. so it was that and it was like you know as the the fellowship is climbing through the crags of uh, I, I don't even remember the mountain range but they're they're all in that that very slim edge as those stone giants or whatever show up and start chucking stuff at them and the storm gets all crazy <laughs> that's that's what this this thin ledge is all about. Okay. That's how we, we got that inspiration. I believe you called these red herrings, by the way. Absolutely. Yes. Red herring. It, that, that was on purpose. We wanted things that would make the player assume that they should go a certain way. And the reason for that was because we wanted people to come in here and play this more than once, not solve it on the very <laughs> first try, make sure that you come in, play it more than once. And you have that sense of mastery. And a big part of it was for, for guys like you guys, uh, to, to share that knowledge with your communities. It's super beneficial for, for everybody. You know, you guys have something to talk about. We can make something that demonstrates a sense of mastery. It worked out really well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely didn't clear this on... I mean, nobody cleared it on the first try, but that's definitely part of the appeal for something like this is just figuring out piece by piece, okay, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? How far does this go? How much longer do we have to go? And uh, again, just sense of scale is like, how big is this place? How much mm -hmm. more do we have to do? Where does this <laughs> all go? I, I love that feeling. Yeah, Rob is uh, an amazing artist. And Rob built all of this traversal section. Um, he just, he's just really good. He's one of the best artists I've ever worked with, had the privilege to work with. And yeah, I'm really happy with how it all, all came together. You called this section when we were going through it a parkour a lot. Uh, I mean, I obviously get that when you're, when like you go from being, you know, kind of the freshly born deer wobbling its legs through these sections, and then, uh, then you eventually go to like the parkour section where you're very experienced and it feels like you're just free running through this entire thing. You want to uh, talk to me like a little bit about that? Yeah. So in building these <clears throat> skinny paths with all of the the physics objects that are you know, they just slap you into oblivion. The idea was to build a sense of flow mm -hmm. for for players as they move through the traversal sections. So we call it parkour. Uh, that's very specifically the the part after that diamond red diamond shaped hallway that sort of chucks you in the trash chute if you're <laughs> if you're inside of it. Um, that section we we Rob and I would refer to as parkour because he was like, I want to build something that feels like parkour. So with the the geysers sort of spitting you off the edge there you have to hit the sense of flow you have to commit to every jump there's no stopping and starting between each of each of the things mm -hmm. so that's why we referred to it as parkour like as that one section did the did that section always have those uh taken boops on it uh it didn't actually i i'm the person who added those in there <laughs> uh, because we needed something else that really pushed players to keep moving without those boops the 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 gameplay experience is basically just players walking to each ledge and then carefully timing each jump so we needed another sense of tension we started with I think snipers that were all the way in the back. Yeah, There's I, a couple taken snipers. I, I, rem I remember those from like the very early builds that I played. Yeah. So those guys came in as like the first pass, but they weren't quite fitting the bill. Like they added a little bit of tension, but they kind of turned into annoyance and they didn't really promote players continuing to move through the, the parkour section. Right. So the, the taken boops were really the thing that just put it in the perfect spot. Mm hmm. Um, and I want to say that we added those. So I should I should clarify for for everybody uh, you know watching and listening. We made this. I I was the designer and I worked with Rob on the traversal section, which is all this jumping in the first half. And I worked with Alex on the combat section. So while Rob was building traversal, I was designing combat with Alex. So I was doing both at the same time. Mm -hmm. I ended up putting those boops in the combat section. And that's when, you know, we were reviewing that kind of stuff 
and we're like, oh, this is pretty cool. Like, these are useful here. I wonder if we could put those back in the traversal section, if that would make it more interesting. So that's yeah. how we got to that point. Cool is an interesting way of putting that uh, <laughs> that, that emotion that I felt. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> Yeah, I remember going through this. Uh, I literally did. I tried every single one of the ports. Very frustrated at this. But then once you knew the secret, it wasn't frustrating anymore. Absolutely. And that's that's fully intentional. It's uh, a point of this isn't super hard. Sometimes some, you know, when you're making video games, you can make things that are too hard and they, they hit that spot of frustration. And I wish that there was like some secret formula that I could say like, oh, I use this. This is the method that I use to figure it out. Really, what I did as a designer to figure out whether or not something was going to be like not frustrating and fun and like felt like an accomplishment was just my gut. It was just I played this thousands of times and I really just tried to put myself in that headspace of someone who had never played it before who wanted to, to experience it for the first time or someone who was a master and be like, oh, look, follow me. I know where to go. I know all the secrets. So one of the great things about working like at Bungie was uh, just having um, like the ability to just walk up to people's desks and be like, hey, can you play this real quick? Because I remember you like, you just message me, mm -hmm. message me on Skype and just be like, hey, can you come uh, give this, can, can, come, come downstairs, give it a try and mm -hmm. walk downstairs over to your desk and then I could like play the next section that you had just moved all the little boops around and I'd be like oh this, this feels really difficult to to get through um and uh then like you would you know do some tweaks 30 minutes later come back down oh oh yeah no I'm yeah I'm able to actually survive through this uh I just noticed that uh Zol started talking uh, <laughs> do you do you want to talk about Zol a little bit before we go through this hellscape that is the green? Yeah, one? let's let's talk about that. So uh, this gets back into this is kind of a point we didn't touch on quite yet, but going back to the themes and the feelings of like delving into darkness and discovering you know what's in the mystery inside the crust of uh, mm -hmm. of of Io, right? So I have this imagining of what is the what is the black spindle? What is this crazy powerful gun that you got when you went into Crota's throne world in D1, right? So I I thought of this, and please bear in mind, this isn't canon at all. This is just me being a, a designer and a player and thinking about like what would be a cool story to tell. Um, so in my head, the way I thought about it was the black spindle was like Crota's manifestation of his his power. You know, he's got a sword and you know, does all this high magic -y stuff in a player. If they take a piece of Crota's power in my mind, it would be black spindle. It's the sword logic, right? Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you kill things that are big bosses with a weapon like black spindle. So how would that continue? How would that like locus of power continue? Well, worm gods are what the hive tithe to. So having a worm God, which lined up really well with, with this release, having the worm God Zul, be something that could offer its power to a guardian was kind of a theme that I was thinking of. So my pitch for that was uh, the the taken without Oryx were sort of like lost and running rampant on the moons of Saturn. And uh, Io being one of those, they had sort of sequestered all of their power. They kind of like gathered in this pocket dimension, which is in my mind, the whisper. And when Zol was killed, by uh, the Guardian at the end of Warmind, the the Taken gathered up the remains of Zol's power. So this this amorphous thing, this uh, like his soul, basically, right? His undying soul. They took it and moved it to this pocket dimension, and they're feeding it light from the Traveler's Cradle. And that's kind of what I was thinking about. And that's why we're in here. So the player, the the player being uh, the Guardian, you know the your your guardian has encountered this and found this pocket dimension because those taken have got grown so powerful that these little mini bosses popped out uh you know aspect of hatred aspect of uh mm. i think it's darkness um i i can't even remember their names but they were they were based off of d1 characters um to arc uh drevis Drexus? I, I don't remember the name of the the wolf baroness and then um 
uh, Urzok. So mm-hmm. those were all intentional choices. Picking those names, having those guys there as like these taken entities that were these, you know, demigods, they were leaking out into our reality, into the the Guardians' reality, and they were still gathering more power to feed to Zol. So when you kill them, it opens the gateway into their pocket dimension, and that's how you pop into the Whisper. So that's how I always imagined all of this. And then when you get through there and you finally slay them, Zol's no longer being taken care of by these powerful Taken. He offers his power to the Guardian, and that is the Whisper of the Worm. He's, you know, he's he's giving you these platitudes and and offering you power, but at what cost, you never know. So long-winded, but that's that's how I always I always imagined it going in mm. in my mind. Yeah, there's holes in the yeah. thing that I described. <laughs> Lots mm-hmm. of big big holes. So that's why I say, you know, it was my head cannon mm-hmm. because that helps me as a designer just really keep like a, a beacon, a guiding light for what the experience is, how players experience this this moment, right? Mm-hmm. So that I think that carried through super well in in all the different elements of this experience of of delving into the deep, um, you know, slaying the worm god, clearing these taken out of this pocket dimension, and claiming you know the worm god's power for your own. I think that was that was really it. Um, when you made uh, the green room, uh, did you realize that you were making like the absolute best farming spot bar none? <laughs> that that would exist in the game as well. Uh, yeah, like I said, I'm I'm a big Destiny player, so <laughs> I, I totally did that on purpose. And I'll start with the reason why I put those things down there. Uh-huh. So in in testing out the green room, we realized that it didn't come across super clearly that you had fallen through one of the cracks and you're in a place you shouldn't be. So one of the ideas to fix that was to stick a bunch of enemies there. That would always respawn. So I chose Shadow Thrall because they don't really drop anything. I don't. I don't know if anyone has noticed this, but they they don't actually really yeah, drop just, anything. It's just ammo, which is really great for farming, uh, like farming yeah, up your exactly. weapons and bounties. <laughs> exactly. So well, it turns out that there are bounties that are like, hey, just kill a bunch of dudes. So that synergized really well. And I think the reason why it was accepted at the time, and in talking, you know, with the investment teams and making sure that we didn't create another loot cave. This is not a loot cave. You have to go in pretty deep. Mm -hmm. You have to play for several minutes before you even get to that point. And you have to be good at it. Like you have to, you know, have conquered it. So you have to beat it once to get the heroic version to make it farmable. You have to have mastered this. So like most players aren't going to put that time in. So that's why it, it turned out to be okay. And it also added extra value to the mission itself by giving players the spot to really like farm stuff up and, and work on those bounties, you know, so... Um, yeah. So, yeah, uh, Dad and I just did the entire jump, the, the jump section. Um, the first time I came into the green room, uh, I was just like, what is what? How do I get past this? And mm. eventually, like, I had to get pointed to, OK, start start going on this path. Just see what see what happens. And um, like I ended up doing the entire jumping puzzle up to here. And I want to say for like. The next like five or six times I went through this mission doing the test, I was like, there's there's no way people are going to be able to actually clear through this entire mission and mm-hmm. like do this jump puzzle. You're going to have to <laughs> change this. And then we realized or then uh, I think uh, it was Doug uh, was like, hey, go check under the stairs or mm-hmm. go check under the stairs. And there was a little shortcut there. Um, so Why? Why? I also would really like to know 100%. Why. So Rob uh, pitched this room to me in a different way. The green room was a, a different animal. Both of us really hated it. Mm-hmm. So we had the parkour <laughs> section. We had some other parts. We had the balls room. Um, but the green room was like kind of a, I would almost say like a, a stumbling block, like, you know, creative block in some way. And we went through several iterations and then Rob just wholesale threw it in the trash and was like, I'm going to work on something and make something cool. And I was like, cool, we'll figure it out. He shows it to me and it's in gray box. It looked very similar to uh, to how it actually shipped. Mm-hmm. It's just this, you know, mess of cracks and dark hallways and all that. And I was like, dude, this is nuts. And he goes, well, hold on. I think this is why it's okay. He shows me the secret entrance. And I was like, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I immediately was like, yeah, it's okay. It actually is. Like if you, if you throw all of this in here 
and you make players think that they have to traverse along the sides and you know uh, i'm jumping around but if you make players traverse around the sides like that's gonna eat a ton of time we need that you know the actual exit is here and he was really leaning into the theme of uh red herrings mm-hmm. so that led us to one spot where it was like well why would players even take this path once they figure it out it'll be worthless and and i was like yeah that sucks because like i really love this room and you made a cool jumping puzzle all the way around up to the top so that was when we started to add in the chests like mm. we, we knew that was a perfect spot to put the chest um sometimes as you're making games you you hit these moments of like just good synergy where like a bunch of ideas kind of like stick together and the chests were were one of those things with the green room like we were designing the the longer tail for this mission the the uh, heroic version at the same time as we were designing the basic version so having those extra nooks and crannies in that space was very important because then uh you know we got to a point of like uh ben one of the engineers who we were working with he created the 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 vault of glass puzzle so his pitch for for adding something to this was vault of glass puzzle we'll have the uh the oracles come in we had to figure out a spot for it we didn't know where that was going to be all this other stuff all these little pieces and i was like well how do you get there how do we know it's different he's like well what if we had some chests and i was like i know a good spot for one of those chests <laughs> green room you know the little nook at the very beginning to the right after that drop like all the spots that the chests ended up in were sort of after the fact they were extra bits that just happen as you're building um you know a, a video game level there's nooks and crannies to make the art look good and then we found uses for all those nooks and crannies and then tried to prune out some of the ones that just didn't didn't work all right so as we're uh, flying down in, in into here again um we're doing the normal version right now because this character hasn't done the heroic um why are there two versions of this there's a heroic and there's a normal version. I mean, my guess is going to be just replayability, right? They have this giant, they have this giant thing that they spent so much time on. Absolutely. Damn it, you're you're playing it, you're playing it a whole bunch. <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was really to add more value. Like the, I, I'm trying to think of how we got to that decision, but yeah, it was really to add more value because if players just played it once, I mean that's kind of all of Destiny, right? Like everything is going to be played hundreds or thousands of times over and over again every part of the game right so i think that's probably how we got there um but yeah it was it was always kind of like a a core part of the design like from day one we were like all right play it once why would you play it again and we spent a lot of time talking that over and so for me um the easiest answer was well there's a normal and a heroic version and so answering the question of what's the heroic version Mm -hmm. was a a months-long process um, so we knew like off whiteboards and paper, there's going to be two versions. How do we make two versions? Okay. Well, let's worry about the second version after we built the first version. Cause we don't even have one yet. Right. So that was where we started. We started with the, the normal version and then figuring out the, uh, heroic version was, you know, big contributions from the investment team, specifically, uh, this guy, Mark, uh, Mark is great dude, really good designer. Um, he had a lot of strong ideas and helped us come to the spot of, of building the, uh, you know, building in the chests and the the unlock for the catalyst. He's the guy who who came up with the system of catalysts in the game in the first mm, place. Okay. So, nice. yeah, we we talked with him. Um, you know, he and I coordinated pretty well on what what that would be and how long the replayability is. I'm not a super strong systems designer, so when we get into you know the weeds of working in Excel and looking at spreadsheets and crunching <laughs> numbers, I'm that's not my thing. I'm more a storyteller, and I like to I like to build experiences for players instead of you know fuss around with the twiddly bits of of a video game. That's that's just not something I'm super good at. Mm-hmm. I, I will say the like the the ship that you get from the like heroic repeatable version of this for doing that secret. It, I, I still use it. I still use that it's ship. A great to ship. This day. Yeah. It's a Sam. great ship. Why would you not? It's a great <laughs> ship. You're welcome, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going into the section that uh, you had a lot of input on this here, uh, Viper. Uh, oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, I, I spent a lot of time in here. Um, I spent a lot of time building all of this stuff. So now, um, 
when this came out, it was a really big challenge to build uh, something really hard in the Destiny 2 sandbox because Destiny 2's design philosophy was at a different spot at the at the time. It was, you know, the the weapons were in different slots, um, power was a different thing. Figuring out what players had at their disposal and what were the strongest tools was paramount. Understanding like, okay, how do I push players outside their comfort zones and make them use all the tools in their kit? How do I make them think about primary? How do I make them think about their element? So making them think about their energy weapon choice was really important. So trying to, to play off of that stuff was, was big. So in this first room, I made sure that the energy shields that I put on the combatants were of a specific element. In this hallway here, it's just more of that same element. So we've got the solar shields on these guys. And that was the point, was, all right, you got to use your solar shields. You got to use or your, uh, your solar weapons to get rid of these solar shields to work through each of these little combat puzzles. And then you could kind of use the rest of the tools in your toolbox, your fire team, your coordination, your communication to to get through the other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, putting the the boopers in here was really the work the, of Satan. <laughs> the entire reason was because this space is literally like almost one for one in multiple dimensions. The same space, just the combat section as the Shadow Thief Strikes combat section, but flipped on one axis <laughs> for multiple rooms. Huh. So as you drop here and you walk out into this room uh, with all the wizards, this is actually the room with the spider tank in it from the Shadow Thief. So you have your pathways on the sides. Oh yeah. But it's, yeah, there's it's the literally cover section. that room. Yeah, no, it's, it's totally flipped. You start at the high ground. You're working from the low ground to high ground, so to speak, in this one, or yep. in, the, in this version. Yeah, okay. So the reason that that choice was done was because that gave us a really good starting point. We knew that that strike worked. It was a winning formula. Mm -hmm. And with that strike working, it also it was just it felt nostalgic. Like even if players couldn't put their fingers on it to say like, "Oh, this is this mission." You just knew like somewhere, you know, it felt familiar. Uh so yeah, this this room's all about void. I even like I insisted that these side paths, so working with Alex, I insisted that these side paths were put in, these little tunnels, because it mirrored the same design from Shadow Thief. They had little tunnels on the sides that you could duck into. You know, you fight the thrall in those tunnels, you you know, go right. go down different little shoots. Yeah. Um the to, to me this this section and like most of the combat section just kind of felt like a puzzle in and of itself almost, like trying to figure out like how the hell do I get to safety for like one second, dude? Like I just need a safe <laughs> spot to stand without getting have fire thrown at me or a wizard or just like anything. Or getting so yeeted into a room from a booper. <laughs> right, yeah. Just all those things combined just being like, how how do I make this a safe spot for just one second, dude? So I felt like when I played the Shadow Thief and got my spindle, which I spent a lot of time doing and I, I helped friends through. My biggest frustration point was that you didn't want to die because the, the penalty for dying was like 45 seconds or some ridiculous thing to respawn yourself. So you couldn't mm -hmm. just throw yourself at, at combat to try to figure things out. And I didn't like that. So I purposefully went in and said, you know what? I'm going to turn that respawn penalty off and just crank the difficulty up. So use whatever you want. Punch things, use shotguns, you know, dive in the middle of the room. I don't care. It's not going to be that big of a deal if you die. Really, you just you're you're trying to go, you know, punch your way through a meat grinder. And it feels far less frustrating if you can just get yourself back up. If it's actually like more of a pain as a player to revive yourself or revive your buddy, it actually kind of feels better. Mm -hmm. Um in the end. Uh Real quick on the whole Shadow Thief thing, do we mean Lost to Light, the daily heroic yes, mission? Yes. Is that, that what we're that talking was, about? That was, it, that was it. Absolutely. Okay. I was I like, it was, it was the Shadow Thief Strike, though, wasn't it? Yeah, because it was the same same tennis. play space. It was the same play space uh, that you were Yeah, in. absolutely. And a lot of the time that I spent fiddling with combat was setting these blights 
putting these blights in different spots. And I I approached a philosophy where placing placement of the blights actually worked as cover for both the player and for the enemy. Yep, it definitely so I does. Made it. <laughs> so I made it so that you could use a blight. Like if you cleared a blight, you could then use that blight to block shots from enemies trying to kill you if you didn't destroy the blight. So it turned into this, especially in this room, this is really the only room where you need to destroy most of them, if not all of them, to make the room easier for you because there's not a lot of cover other than the blights. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I, was just, I was gonna say, you, this is definitely some place where I did not want to leave those blights up at all. Yeah, absolutely that was fully intentional and this was like a since this was kind of a love letter to the original d1 mission so to speak um it, it is funny that you don't have to kill the blights in in this version of it but in the d1 version to progress it you had to destroy the blights that was the yeah. number one thing to, to do so i personally hated that in the first <laughs> one i really did and so i was like well i want to use these blights in a way that feels better to to me as a player which is and again you know like i said my my north star on this was i want to make something that i want to play mm -hmm. as a as a hardcore destiny player so yeah it was really i was like well what what purpose do these even serve anyway and i realized that i could just use them as extra bits of cover and that kind of gives the player a bit of choice about which ones they destroy which ones they leave up and it totally affects the combat space in that in that regard yeah, I definitely. Uh, the interesting thing was going through this like in the old uh, sandbox where we didn't have you know kinetic weapon, special weapon, uh, and then power weapon. We had it was two, essentially two primary weapons and then a heavy weapon, and sometimes exactly. a special weapon. So I remember like going through this the first time. Uh, my kinetic weapon didn't even matter. I I remember I used Risk Runner and then I think the Iklos shotgun a lot mm -hmm. and then i had like a scout rifle in case i needed to shoot something far away um i don't know were you kind of surprised that the mission still holds up really well to just all all the different like or the newer sandbox and everything too i honestly think that's testament to the sandbox team mm -hmm. at bungie i i think they just they had a lot of really good ideas and they built some really good stuff so the fact that it still holds up I don't. I wouldn't say it has anything necessarily to do with encounter design so mm -hmm. much as like the dudes just know what they're doing when they build guns, when they build uh, combatants. It just. It was. I had such great tools to work with that it. It ended up holding up. Yeah. I was very surprised that it did. Honestly. Is there is there anything else here that you wanted to go over, Vince? Uh. Okay. So, in the back, and this this didn't work as well as I'd planned. I wanted this big reveal for the bosses because uh -huh. there's three bosses. And in the very back of the room where you have all of the the Vex Milk waterfall stuff happening, yeah. you can actually see the three bosses held in these little like egg-shaped taken blight things. Like they're they're in their little taken blight cocoons. So I was really sold on this, you know, again, this is that whole idea of like these very powerful taken are in here feeding light to to the remnants of Zol's power, right? Mm -hmm. And if players notice, like as you drop in uh, through this top section, before you kill that first set of monsters, um, the, the Centurions, I think, before you kill that first set of guys, you'll see all three of the bosses in the very back of the room uh, floating in their little cocoons, in their respective cocoons. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's it, it didn't land super well because like it's hectic, super chaotic, so it's hard to kind of like really just show, hey, you know this this thing is happening here. Mm -hmm. That reveal was was tricky. It didn't work out. It wasn't my best, but you know it still ended up being really fun. And yeah. I think the three bosses was just a uh, turning that dial way up for <laughs> players. Yeah, at the time, absolutely. Yeah, um, I will say like kind of ending comments it, it is kind of weird that to me when you're running through that mission um you don't actually really like using whisper that much like it, it's it's kind of difficult to use it just with how much stuff is assaulting you while you're trying to actually push forward absolutely was that a conscious conscious decision to make it's like it wasn't no honestly i tried to make it work with whisper 
but it was really, really hard mm. to build something that played well and was still challenging without having Whisper. So the happy accident of that design was having it so that Whisper was super good at killing the bosses at the end. Mm. So it helped you carry. It helped players beat the heroic version. And I was like, you know what? That's probably enough. I think if I get lost in trying to make Whisper work throughout the whole thing, then it's it's just going to not be super great. Gotcha. Dado, like, what was, since you were, you didn't know this was coming. Uh, no. What what the hell, what was that like for you? I'm just going to launch us into the mission to kind of do that while, while we talk about this again. Um, I mean, for, for me, it was just sort of like a breath of fresh air, honestly. Like, we had we had that secret mission back in D1 and then we really hadn't seen anything else like it until like whisper 2.0 or or like black spindle 2.0 essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was, it was just something that we hadn't seen in a really, really, really long time. And, uh, it was exciting because it feels like nowadays nothing's a secret anymore, right? Everything is data mined. Everything is something is leaked. Uh, you know, everyone is finding out so many things before the thing actually happens. So to have something truly secret and just pop in and legit nobody knew about it was just really, really fun as a member of the community, as, as just a player of the game um, and everything in between, really. It was definitely as, uh, uh, it was definitely fun, go- like seeing everyone kind of do this it was a like we all basically kind of took the day off work so to speak where we just we sat at our desk at work and then we just had like reddit threads pulled up we had uh everyone's twitch streams open like just to see okay who's going to be the first one to actually do this because we we knew when when it was gonna when the flip was going to be switched yeah i uh switch switch was going to be yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) i uh (laughs) i was anxiously sitting at my desk just <laughs> sweating and shaking and refreshing reddit and like I, I think i even booted the game up and i was just standing in io like dancing <laughs> like hey look at me guys like there might be a special spawn near me did, <laughs> but nobody did you know it. did you know that like it was gonna be a hit like the moment it launched no it mm. it was horrifying i was like really? this could be a mess this could be like the end of my job, like for real. It, it, I was like, I was so scared. And uh, and then as soon as it landed, I would like, I mean, Holtz, you can attest to that. You know, I, I repeatedly like I asked a lot of questions. I'm like, is this really good? Oh, yeah. Like I asked Holtz, I asked Mercules, I asked, uh, you know, Rathona. Like I, I just repeatedly asked those guys. I was like, is this, am, are we making good choices? Like, I, I feel like I am, but... I'm not every destiny player, you know, I'm a very specific one. So yeah. And watching it just take off, like it wasn't the first instance that it popped up because I saw that happen. The second time it showed up, uh, was, was really when it went. And that was that first post from that one guy on Reddit. We had it in our, our, uh, guardian con now GCX talk. Um, where we had a screen cap of that Reddit thread. And the guy was like, I don't know if anyone's seen this before, this is probably old and you know not real. So if it is, I'm sorry and ignore me. And it literally just, the first time that has ever happened that something someone said, I don't know if this has been said before, and it actually hasn't. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And of course, like the first five responses are people telling him to go away, and he's wrong, and it's nothing new. And then like the fourth or fifth response, whatever you know, sixth, seventh, someone's like, No, 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 y'all need to shut up. This guy's onto something. I don't know what this is. And then it just exploded and it was like it's live boys it's in here we found a thing and like the thread just went off and then my my dms at work started exploding i'm just like getting you know messages from all over the studio people like it's happening (laughs) and it was just it was wild to watch were you nervous because of like technical issues like we were like oh what if this thing breaks or was it more of like a just a general response to like Oh, how are people going to like this kind of thing? Are they going to think it's too hard? Uh, you know, what, what was what was like one of your biggest fears? So everything you mentioned, absolutely. Um, my biggest fear was probably whether or not players would enjoy it. I tend to like really hard 
video games. Like, I like playing Dark Souls. I like playing Sekiro. I like playing, you know, solo challenging stuff. So I was really worried that, you know, just as a designer, like, my, my chops, my assumptions were wrong. Like, the best way to prove it is by making some crazy stuff and seeing if players like it. So that was a big, big point for me personally, just to be like, did I make good choices? Like, can I be a good designer? Like, so I, I was also coming off of uh, uh, Curse of Osiris. I worked on that. I made the um, the Saint Fourteen mission. So that mission where you go find him in the dark future of Mercury had Se- Season of Dawn. Very, yeah. Okay. It had uh, not, uh, not 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 season of dawn. Uh, no, 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 no. The original Christmas Christmas Iris, Christmas like, Iris. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. oh, okay, okay, okay. So I had come off of that, and I was like reeling. You know, it didn't have great responses. Like the the expansion itself had not super great responses uh, reception, I should say. Um, and just I, I was scared. You know, I was like, I'm gonna put something in here that I think the game needs. And I hope players like it. So coming off of that, in that mentality, and watching how how visceral the reaction was when, you know, Saint Fourteen was dead in that mission, like players were upset, like very upset. They were mad that he was dead. They wanted him to, you know, they wanted a different reaction, or uh, they wanted a, a a different fate for Saint Fourteen. So I was coming off of that, and then I get into this, and I'm like. Uh, I hope this works. Please don't be mad. So yeah, I was I was full of nerves, um, really just scared, and I, I've had mixed reactions to it. Just talking to players over the over the years, like some people are like, dude, it was way too hard. I couldn't do it, or you know, admitted, hey, I I exploited to complete it, and I'm really glad I I got it done. But why did you make it so hard? And I was like, oh, man, I, I believed in you. You know, like, I believed you could do it. I didn't try to make it so that you couldn't do it. And I'm sad that, like, I made something that you felt like you couldn't do and that you had to exploit to get through it. And, you know, I had this moment at, at GCX when I was talking to this dude, telling him this. And I was like, man, I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, you should try it. Like, play it again. I would love for you to play it again. And I think you can do it. Gave him a couple tips, and I was like, "Just practice, man. You know, put your time in. You you can totally get it done." And he was like, "Thanks. I'll I'll totally give it a shot." And then there are other players who are like, "Oh my god, I loved it. The challenge was perfect. It was enough." Like, I had some people even tell me like, "Make it harder," and I'm like, "That, that is <laughs> that, that's silly. Like, that would make it frustrating. You know, nobody's gonna like that. Making it harder would uh, encroach on territory of like." I don't know what those platformers are called, what the genre is, but it's like uh, like Super Meat Boy, and I want to yeah. be the guy. Yeah. Frame, exactly. frame perfect, frame perfect yeah. execution stuff. You just you practice the same jump for hours, and then you finally nail it. Like, and for me, that's not fun. I I get it, but I see like, you know, I see the the whole journey ahead of me in games like that, and I'm like, oh. In order to beat this, I'm going to spend the next 15 hours practicing this level. I, d- I don't want to do that. <laughs> like, I'd, I'd rather just play other games, you know, maybe go outside. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm kind of in tune to that philosophy as well. Just like, I want it to be hard, but maybe not like ball-bustingly hard. But that's something I feel like Destiny has lacked overall as, as a total part of the franchise. It's just like, it's, you know, a couple of things that are more difficult than... Than other things in the game and right. i'm glad that this was one of those things because you know I, I feel like if it wasn't so hard it would have taken away from some of the appeal of it in the first place absolutely um that was also intentional designing for exclusivity knowing that not every player would do it was the point and that sucks i know some people aren't going to enjoy hearing that like it sucks to to have that sort of like reality check you know coming to jesus so to speak of like you can't do this you know you're not good enough to do this but at the same time when you do overcome the challenge it feels so much better than than if you like walked in and you just got it done it's not 
it's not as rewarding, you know? It's not as memorable. But knowing, 100%. like, I spent all this time in here and I finally beat this challenge. Oh, my God, it feels so good. Like, that's why I play video games. Yeah, actually, at, uh, like, overcoming some of that skill adversity. Just because I feel like, you know, most of Destiny is just... It's kind of just like a walk in the park, you know? Like, there's not too many things that are kicking your ass. Um, especially things that are just like, that you find out in the wild just randomly, right? That Destiny doesn't have a lot of those things where it's like, what the hell? I just came across this random thing and it's completely destroying me. What the hell is going on? Mm -hmm. And th I, this was one of those things. I had those moments as a gamer, um, especially in like World of Warcraft, playing that and then finding something really cool, like finding a rare spawn and then being like, oh my God, this guy is just wrecking my shit. I need to go get some homies right. and like build some strats and figure this out. That is absolutely the type of experience I wanted to build here is to say like, let's work on this, you know, let's, let's overcome this. We'll be some of the, the elite gamers, you know, get our, get our gamer points and our, <laughs> our clout, right? Like yeah. that's absolutely what this was about. Um, I'm glad to hear that. You know, um, I guess the, the only th other thing to cover is, uh, I guess, kind of a good segue into doing zero hour. Um, I think one of the biggest criticisms that this mission received was not really the mission itself, but just how you actually initially started it uh, with having to do a public event and uh, the the kind of perils that come with a public event spawning has randomness to it. Um, right. Yeah. Do you want to do you want to talk about the I don't know, I guess the, the reception of that? Absolutely. So that was that was tough because, like I said, you know, I was I was here for day one. I was watching it online and I went home that weekend and I played. I played that weekend the whole time. I probably put in a ridiculous amount of time, like 20 something hours. I, I played on Saturday for at least 12 and on Sunday for at least 12. I was carrying randoms. It was just something I was into. The the funniest thing is like carrying a random and then being like in chat like, hey, you want to know something crazy? I made this. And people are like, haha, yeah, bro. And then, you yeah. know, just move on. And I'm like, no, nah, I really did, but it's fine. I don't even care. So uh, experiencing that six and a half hour block of Cabal again <laughs> was not even remotely intended. I wanted players to wait. I wanted players to think about things and spend some time instead of just hopping straight into the big secret. I wanted players to like, you know, have to discover the beginnings of the secret. So that's why there was a wait. I wanted people to gather up, form ad hoc groups, you know, it, which did happen. But waiting, having players wait in excess of an hour was not at all intended. Especially when the mission but, has a 20 minute timer on it. Like, exactly. Right. One chance and, and that's it. And especially at the start, it's just brutal. So without getting too specific, uh, at the time, the reason I chose IO as one of the places to build this was because I knew that in Lost Oasis, there were only two public events and I knew how the timers worked on those. So the, the way the software worked to sort of pick which public event happened actually exposed a an inconsistency in how those things were picked back in the code. So Ben is actually the engineer who ended up fixing it. And he figured out, hey, there's a problem with this scheduler. Like this is a statistical occurrence that is as rare as like once in every eight years or something <laughs> yeah. like that. Oh my so God. Opening weekend, we hit the weirdest possible statistical occurrence to not let the thing pop as often as it should have. Statistically, the longest wait any player should have had was like 50 minutes and it turned into six and a half hours. I got back in the office and, and really like threw out that fix and you know, made some changes to it and it became more frequent, but the damage was already done. So leading into zero hour, that made me want to consider a different approach, something that was deterministic. If you had done all of the steps leading up to it, so that preserved the essence of the secret, the first moments of discovering the secret, and it pulled out that element of RNG, which as a designer, I'm not a big fan of RNG at all. I think that RNG 
will artificially sometimes lead players to these moments of uh, unexpected surprises. And unexpected surprises are really, really positive gameplay moments. So I would prefer to have carefully engineered surprises where right when you're at that moment, you know, almost like in a in a casino, right? Right when you're at that moment of like, oh, this thing's not going to pay out, you win and you win big. It's it's like that. It's that that good moment of, of waiting, of patience, and then you get that thing that you want, you know, you achieve that. So anyway, pulling out RNG was, was uh, again, in my mind, it was a risk because I didn't know how that was going to work out. So to solve that, I also realized that one of the other issues with Zero Hour, or uh, The Whisper, is that people hanging out in IO, in Lost Oasis, weren't having fun. They were just standing there. There wasn't much to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I decided, you know what? I wonder if there's like a social space, because that's where most people, at least in PC Destiny, would try to put together groups is in social spaces. And I was like, I know of a good social space that endgame players are not going to be in the farm. <laughs> and that's that's literally why that ended up working out. Um, I also gated it behind the quest on Titan where you meet Mithrax because I also made that quest. And Mithrax is uh, mm -hmm. one of my babies. He's one of my boys. Like I, That character was... That was one of the first things I put into Destiny. Uh, I worked on Titan as a destination. Um, from the very beginning. So, like, I think the very first thing I made was uh, Firebase Hades in EDZ. That was the very first space that I was given as a designer, and it was, like, gray box, and, you know, I helped flesh that out. Anyway, then I rolled over. I, I did a bunch of other stuff, rolled over onto Titan, worked on Titan, made that quest, and I liked the idea, you know, from the beginning in Zero Hour of carrying Mithrax as a character and bringing him through and having more experiences with that character. I thought he was super neat. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of how I got to that was <laughs> realizing like this weight was not what I wanted. I want to avoid that weight for players again. I want to put them in a spot where they can easily coordinate and try to get a group going. So social space is the way to go, making it a deterministic unlock that was kind of long not every player had done the the quest on Titan where you get Rat King, um, you know the the first drop at least to get Rat King. Especially if they had started like playing during Forsaken too, like you, you you probably didn't go do that part of the campaign. Exactly. So having that in there as well, it just I don't know. I I just I think it worked. Yeah. So yeah, do you want to tee up your uh, what's your what's your segue into zero hour? How are we? Oh, I'm we I'm, I'm probably about? just gonna do a crossfade into us running into it like this and say, hey, uh, so now we're in zero hour, uh, where we didn't or we were able to deterministically start this instead of having to wait on a public event. Mm, mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Good idea. I so for right right off the get right off the bat, you actually start off with combat in this one. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, was that due to like feedback on the first uh, or on Whisper of the Worm? So part of it was I wanted a different feel. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to feel different from Whisper, so that it wasn't just a carbon copy. And people were like, "Oh, well, we're playing Whisper Two. You know, I I didn't want Whisper Two. I wanted this to be its own boy. You know, standing on its own legs." Mm -hmm. But another part of it was just the shape of this environment, mm -hmm. like figuring out what to do with this first room and really like squeezing good gameplay out of it. I knew I was like, well, we got to do combat first. I was like, we, we got to just throw some combat in here because like running through all this, it's just wasted space. Like there's there's nothing interesting about it. And players had done a lot of the discovery up front of finding mm -hmm. this mission, you know, doing the ciphers, uh, discovering all those little things in the lost sectors reading a little bit about it and going like, wait a minute, what? And then they met this dude, right? Like, so you're excited at that point. You you know you're going on a cool mission. You know you're going to do a thing. So might as well start with combat. Okay. And the uh, the theme for this one, so this uh, Whisper is actually codenamed Candy Cane. <laughs> and the big reason for that was, one, to keep a secret, and two, because it, it irritated Rob. I, I love the fact that he's like, we should name it something stupid like Candy Cane. And I was like, done and he's like wait did you actually name a candy cane and i'm like yeah and he's like dude come on no <laughs> so like it was too late at that point so this one he's like we need a cool code name so this one was commando 
and mm. Commando because we both like 80s action movies. Commando is probably my favorite 80s action movie. It's incredible. It it just ticks all the boxes. So that was it for me. And the the idea was like scorched earth. You know, you come in here, you just blast everything, right? You go in blasting, no survivors, you know, no prisoners. Like that's that's the goal here. They're they're on our turf in our home. Get rid of them, right? Yeah. Man, like I, I've just noted one thing about uh, both both the missions missions actually is that like there's still a challenge to go through. It's not you don't over level this at all. <laughs> yeah, that was. Uh, I I really appreciate that. That was a hundred percent by design too. I made sure that in the in the tuning twiddly number bits, it will always be hard, mm. no matter what gear you have. Uh, you know, no matter what power level or you you've got, like it's always going to be hard. Yeah, and uh, I, I definitely, that, that's one of the reasons why I'm kind of sad to see these uh, go into the vault is they are just, they are always a challenge. So if I ever need a challenge, it's like, oh, I'm going go, to go try to solo that again. That was really fun when I was able to go through that. I mean, to this day, it's still like some of the most challenging mm -hmm. content in the entire game. I, I'm glad to hear that. I think that's a good thing. I assume it's a good thing. No, I, I mean, for me, it's absolutely a good thing. I, I mean, I again, I am very much all about challenging content in the game. You know, GM Nightfalls, Master Nightfalls, okay. But something like this, I, I feel like almost hasn't been replicated just yet. Um, just in terms of how it plays and the intensity, combat intensity, because... You know, mm -hmm. I, I was even running some people through this uh, just for fun, just like right before it leaves. And, uh, you know, still coming still coming across times where I'm, you know, just on the edge of beating the boss and, and we, you know, run out of time um, compared to other things where it's like, all right, eventually, you know, you get some level of a mastery of it and then it just kind of becomes a stomp and then it doesn't really matter anymore this still has that intensity every single time. Like you got to show up if you want to run this every single time. True. I do agree. And I with appreciate that. that. You just, You're welcome. I, I like actually having to care about PVE and like, you know, being fast and like knowing timings and knowing spawns and knowing the best gun to use at this time or swapping guns or something like that, where it doesn't feel like, I can let off the trigger until it's over. Mm. Yeah. Uh, one thing that you just noted there is like the swapping weapons. Is that like, uh, is that something that like you're okay with? Like people swapping weapons in, in the mission or? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I wanted, like, like I was saying, you know, back in the, in the whispers, um, run through, I wanted players to think about all the, the tools in the toolkit. Mm -hmm. I wanted them to think about everything that they could possibly do. Because that is an awesome part of Destiny, and I think that it gets missed a lot because a, a big aspect of Destiny is meant to be approachable. It's meant for people to get into the like, oh, well, this gun's cool, and like play with all the different you know things that you can get because all the guns are really fun to use in this game. It's one of the biggest draws. So having something for higher skilled players who have a very deep collection look at it and go like, okay, I can pull this thing out that I really, you know, haven't used forever or like found a good spot for it. Maybe this will be good here. Having that mental, you know, that conversation with yourself was, was really important. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm still using hard light on this, on this thing when I was, you know, carrying people or, or whatever, just cause it's so versatile for something like this that needs, you know, elemental shield destruction basically at every single point in combat absolutely oh, oh. i just i just the uh, uh, rip yeah uh that was again that was that same philosophy from whisper and i carried it forward and made these combat beats uh lean into that a little bit more i made them more thematic than they were in uh in the whisper zero hours shield uses on combatants were different. There's double shields in pretty much every encounter, and then all all the shields in the in the final mm -hmm. final boss battle. Right. Uh, I will say the uh, traversal section is uh, a lot different in this one. 
uh, because there's, <laughs> well, there's like, there's two different traversal sections. Uh, there's like the normal and the heroic version of it, but then the combat stays largely the same uh, in between them. True. Uh, so the, the traversal sections being different was definitely something, and I want to say this came directly from you, Dado, was something that like you wished that the heroic version of Whisper felt different. Right. I remember so, that. So traversal for this is uh, a different artist from Rob. Rob moved into a a more leadership type of a position. He was, you know, more important on the, the higher scope of the projects uh, for Season of Drifter and all that. So I ended up working with Eve, an amazing artist. Like, yeah. she's incredible. Like, insanely good. So uh, she had all these crazy ideas. I also worked with Alex again uh, from Whisper. And Alex, Alex and Eve, like, worked in tandem. Alex built some parts of it, and we had this thing, like, really fleshed out. And then when Eve came into the project, she just brought this totally different vibe, and it it turned into something really cool. One of the first things she did was she built up the um, exterior section. As you come out of the old tower parts and you go through the underwatch where it's all blown apart mm -hmm. and you drop through the elevator shaft, uh, I was pitching to Alex, I was like, we should really be on the outside of the tower, like look underneath the hammerhead top at the part where players have always been. And Alex was like, yeah, I don't know if we can do that. Like, I, I think we can. I'm not sure. Luckily, Eve built the tower. So she came in and was like, I got this. She's <laughs> like, this, this is I, I got this. I love this. And she just went to town and like made it really, really cool. And like the first passes, I was like, this is amazing. So uh, working with her, I, I would say the the bigger challenges were like trying to make traversal not as hard. Eve definitely indexed towards let's make this really, really hard. Like every single jump, every single part was super hard. And going back to the design philosophy on the Whisper, where we talked about parkour, making moments where you can have that sort of a downbeat in your level of effort is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, also, to her credit, she built the Sherpa switches. Yeah. All of that stuff that, like, so great. Like, it was her idea. She's like, yo, I can put these in. They're going to be sick. And they were perfect. It was like, I, I want to say it was like Rob's suggestion at first. Rob was like, hey, what can we do to, uh, you know, make this cooler for people who are experienced right who who know what this stuff is that can can show a little bit of mastery but help their buddy who's like bad and can't make it through these jumps and he was like i got an idea as soon as she showed the first one i want to say it was in the normal version it was that construction boom that pops out mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. off that first jump on the backside. that was the first one she built and we were like yep and then we just had her put them in in a couple of other places and it was it was amazing so yeah I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I know something like that came in handy for uh, for some people. Although the one place where there is none is on the heroic on the outside of the wall jumping section, which is uh, for some people still an absolute <laughs> nightmare. Oh, it's hard. It's very hard. Yeah. Uh, and and the reason I was okay with that is because of the the things that come before and the things that come after. It's right. one of those. It's one of those downbeats. Like. You know, you, or it's one of those higher points where you have to do a bunch of crazy stuff and then you get kind of like moments of rest. So having those moments of rest are what makes it easier to handle. The there's There was this other concept. The reason why I picked 20 minutes for a timer yeah. is because it feels not as bad to fail at minute 19 as it does to fail at minute 29. Like, mm. oh my God, minute 29 failures are agony like adding just another 10 minutes onto that and then you screw up is the worst feeling but 20 for some reason like not having a half hour reset but like 15 minute reset it feels a little more doable it just it feels more approachable like and again that's that's my gut it wasn't anything like i don't have data to support this i'm just like you know what this feels better this feels like i could do this i may have messed up but i could do this i made progress last time you know so like the first iterations of the maze, you came through a series of events and it just spit you out in the maze. 
So you didn't even know you were in a maze. Yep. And then you just killed by this like unseen force. You had no idea what it was that even killed you. So the yeah, biggest... I remember someone in my group was just like, oh, it's a maze. Like he was looking at the map from above and just be like, it's a maze. It's a maze. I'll, I'll guide you around it. That was actually the very first thing uh, I did to fix it was we really wanted the maze. Alex was super bought into the idea. Um, Rob loved the idea too, but we weren't making the maze sell really well. And I was like, you know what? I think this is the problem. Players don't know that they're in a maze. So we shifted the whole thing down and built that little observation room. Mm -hmm. uh, back in a previous life, AKA like 10 plus years ago, I was a network engineer before I became a game designer. And for me, the concept of a knock was like this thing, a network operations center. So having that overview at the top of the hangar, you know, like sort of like traffic control type of a thing, it like, it just made sense. It was a room that I'd seen in real life before in multiple occasions. My dad's a pilot. So I've been in air, uh, you know, aircraft hangars and all that stuff. So I just had this moment of like, oh my God, we need to show the maze below the player. Let's do that. And here's how we're going to do it. You'll drop down into like an observation room. So you'll come out of these vents and instead of falling directly into the maze, you'll end up in this, uh, this operations room that oversees the entirety of the maze. And that just, that was number one that worked perfectly. And I think the first time Holtz saw it, he was like, Oh, I get it. There's this little picture. I, I can see the things. I'll tell you guys what's going on. Yeah. And you know, just like you said that I was, it, it worked. And I was like, Oh my God, my assumptions are right. <laughs> you know, it just it's very validating. We spent a lot of time really, really trying to polish those tells. The other the other issue was determining which edge of the maze you were in and which corner you were in. So we used colors and and uh, little subtle cues like cabling and shapes of the wall so that you can tell you're on one part versus another part. And most players don't even notice. They don't even talk about it. They're just like, I'm here. They know because their brain subconsciously understands what direction they're in because the hallways actually look differently, different depending on which angle you're, you're pointed right. at, you know, which conduit you're, you're taking a look at. All that stuff is, is different depending on where you are in the maze. So, since we're going to be running through this uh, again one more time, uh, I guess we can talk about the puzzle, because right over here, there's a little key card. Mmm, the key a, cards. Got a keypad, and then that unlocks, uh, I don't know, it's the equivalent of the green room uh, from Whisper of the Worm in terms of frustration and difficulty, but now it's a, now it's a like, physical puzzle that mm -hmm. you have to <laughs> solve as well within the mission. Um. Yeah, I, I know you. Uh, you you didn't design it. That was uh, uh that was once again Ben, uh, who designed the yeah. Whisper of the Worm, uh, puzzle. Uh, he did a hard 180 on, <laughs> on the uh like puzzle difficulty and like just the overall you know, what you had to do for the puzzle, uh, to complete it. Yeah. So Ben gave me a pitch for this puzzle when we finished whisper mm -hmm. so like we immediately knew like we got to make another one and what we're gonna make it better we're gonna make it awesome it's gonna be bigger better faster stronger all the things right yeah. and that included uh the puzzle to some degree so we wanted it to be more in integrated into the mission itself as opposed to just being find some chests you know look at a portal um get a get a ship right shoot some oracles in a way that you've already shot them if you played d1 um this puzzle requires significantly more effort from yep. players to solve. And that, uh, you know, that's, that's, that was Ben's vision. And it was, it was challenging to try to strike the balance of making a really cool puzzle that players who love puzzles want to do and making something for players who like, uh, FPS RPG games, which is, you know, destiny. So, in that vein, uh, Ben and I had a lot of back and forth where, you know, we, we had to make some compromises and like really pare things down. And I'm happy with the version that we, we ended up shipping with. I think it turned out really good. 
it's awesome and I like the level of complexity. That being said, I personally as a player did not enjoy necessarily going through all the twiddly bits. I waited until there was like a key and people had solved it fully and then I did that and I used someone else's tool to, to figure it out because I knew that it changed. It wasn't consistent. Like you couldn't just memorize it. And, and that was like, that was an interesting point because you know we had a lot of back and forth. I was like, I want a puzzle that you can memorize and you know, leadership, uh, I want to say it was like Lars and Ben, um, Lars Backen and, uh, and myself and Ben, you know, we were talking about these things and Lars was like, you know, I understand, I understand where you're coming from. He's like, I'm that type of player too. He's like, however, players that like puzzles are really going to love this. He's like, and I think, I think Ben's onto something here. So let's, let's put in some safeguards. So we coded in a bunch of stuff that if it was too bad, we could avoid a, uh, you know, a Niobe Labs, right? Mm -hmm. Not have something that was where you're just like, dude, what the hell is this? I don't even understand. <laughs> like, I have to, you know, cluck like a chicken and turn around three times and then look at the moon in order to make this puzzle work. Like, we wanted to avoid that, right? So, I think that disagreement and that tension was how we ended up with the very good thing that we ended up shipping. Um, did you think something like uh, Corridors of Time might have been too much puzzle? Personally? Or do you mean like... I mean, just... I mean, I guess we're kind of talking about puzzles and just you saying how much puzzle is too much puzzle. Mm. And I remember just Corridors of Time being like, Corridors of Time, it's the puzzle that we absolutely, positively do not want you to brute force. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so for me, Quarters of Time is not a puzzle that I would enjoy as a player. So in answer to your question, I would say for me, yeah, that's too much puzzle. But that's that's just me. I know that there were people who loved it. And watching right. like all the information sharing and all the screenshots, watching like, you know, Glad go crazy, like that stuff is cool. I, I think it's neat. Um, it's definitely not something that I would be like, oh, this is sick. I'm going to play this myself. I would be like, oh, cool. I'll let someone else solve that. And I'll <laughs> learn about all the fun times they had solving it. It's, it's kind of like uh, the equivalent of reading about EVE Online. Uh, yeah. Like that game is so massive. It has such a crazy scale to it. And like all the political intrigue and sabotage that goes into some of the stuff that takes literally years to, to build up from players. But um, I'm never going to play that game. I, yeah. I will happily read about it. So that's that's kind of the same way that I am about Destiny puzzles. Like, I, I love it when this stuff is in the game because the community, like, gets to just do this crazy stuff that then other people, like, we, people get to read about Destiny like I read about Eve, which is, Absolutely. you know, I, I think there's there's a lot of good in that. I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think it has its place, uh, and I think it should always be in the game. Um as a player, it's not for me, but I love watching mm -hmm. other people do this stuff. I, I will say I wish we could pull you forward here for combat section. Uh, okay, so now we're in the final. I'll, I'll be there in a second. We are now in the final combat section. And uh, oh, I, I got to say, you got combat in like a really cool way here. I love that there's kind of different rhythms to, uh, to everything here. Like you go from... Uh, I don't know, you go from killing uh, big big servitors to shooting the guy, now little servitors, I don't know, there's just, there's a really fun rhythm that is uh, kind of developed in in uh, in all this combat here. Uh, thanks, I appreciate that. It was, for me, I think the boss fight, so this is just personal, mm -hmm. I think the boss fight is like something that I wish I could have spent more time on to improve, to like really, really polish and do more with. I was more focused on this boss fight with presentation. Like I was saying before in in Whisper, I feel like I had some misses with the presentation of the boss mm -hmm. fight. Uh, just especially in like, you know, those, you, you can't really see the dudes in their little cocoons. Like I have to call it out. No one really notices it. Um, I think presentation got nailed really well in Zero Hour, but I think the, the interesting uh, like movement and stuff from enemies 
didn't happen as well as I wanted. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to be a little more dynamic, a little more, feel more like a battle. And it, it just kind of, it turns into like, okay, look here, do that, shoot this guy, shoot that guy, use this ability at this time. So it becomes kind of like a, there is an optimal way to do it. Formulaic. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's a weird space too. Like it's really big. It's really open. I would say maybe a little bit bigger than it needed to be, but you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like, I, I do like though that because it's so big, you have multiple like I don't know. It's, it's kind of like Whisper. You have multiple options of being able to combat combat this. Like if you want to use a shotgun, get in close, and you know kill the kill one of the tanks that way, you can. If you want to sit back and like you know just pop some Whisper shots into stuff, you can do that too. Um, Mm, I, I, just, mm -hmm, I, I mm -hmm. do like that, you know, there, there's no one set strategy to this. That's one of the kind of strengths of a lot of these missions is that uh, they, they have all those avenues of play to them. So nodding to, you know, my previous work and Whisper, um, that's why I put spider tanks in there. <laughs> one of the most fun things to kill with Whisper is a spider tank. Yep. Uh, you just utterly demolish them with that gun and it... It's super fun. So that's literally why I put so many in here. I wanted to give players another reason to like have fun with Whisper to use it. So instead of just a pure boss killer, you know, it's something different. Boss, this is the one of the only missions where killing the final boss doesn't call doesn't cause all the ads to despawn. Mm hmm. Um, I, I just thought that was that's really cool. Is that intentional? Yeah. There was a sort of a design principle of like killing the final boss is the thing you know it feels good in destiny to kill the final boss and then all the guys clean up like i felt like i wanted players to clean their plate you know mm -hmm. eat, eat, eat all your dinner get all the things if you don't do all the things like why would they explode why would they die like it didn't make sense to me you know you gotta you gotta kill all these things otherwise like the bad guys are still going to win, right? They're going to escape with the gun. Um, I don't know, it also kind of goes back to the whole commando thing. Of yeah, Arnold, Scorched Earth. Ar Arnold didn't let stuff, let stuff live. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And then uh, Mithrax. I, I like seeing Mithrax pop up and the ship ship come up here at the very end, too. <laughs> that's, just, that's just neat little touches like that. Um, so I guess one final thing. We didn't talk about the reward to that one real quick. Um uh it seemed like uh whisper of the worm or whispers on io you, we very much like that was going to be the weapon from the start was outbreak going to be the weapon from the start of this as well i think so so we approached yeah we approached whisper like we need this this needs to come back boom put it in let's go and then we needed to figure out like another celebrity you know uh if you think of weapons like characters they're they're celebrity weapons that everybody knows and remembers um outbreak being one of those so we had a short list we you know talked it over with a bunch of different uh stakeholders in the studio figured out what would be the best fit and outbreak became it and it I, i'm really happy with where it ended up and I, I think it was cool it obviously it was not nearly as powerful as whisper you can't really have a game full of whispers because then whisper's not special anymore right yeah. so mm -hmm. specifically making something like uh like an outbreak that is neat uh was was kind of the goal there i i don't know if outbreak ever really cemented its its place it was super hot when it came out and it worked I mean, on a few things. My team used it for Galron World First. Mm -hmm. And it worked super, super well to the point where I believe there's a lot of other teams that uh, sort of adopted it on the fly. This is what I've been told. I, I didn't actually go watch anyone stream or anything. But yeah, for Galron specifically, we did one run of it. And we're like, all right, time to infuse. Bring them up because this is it. This is how we're doing it. <laughs> um, but yeah, outside I, of that, I don't think it's really had any like huge limelight moments, at least uh, personally. No, and you're totally right on that. And like, I, I was watching and I, I saw that for sure. That happened. That became like the strat. And I think sometime after that, it might have been nerfed or some changes got made to like pulse rifles 
Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a gun that ex that excels when you have a target to shoot for a long time. The problem is that there's not that many of those targets in Destiny, and if there are, uh, there's better options for doing such a thing. Right. But if you want to only use a primary weapon, then do I have the gun for you? I remember at, at that time specifically, there were there were quite a few like power weapons. Like that's where you wanted to use your exotic slot on was a power weapon because there were there were a few that had a pretty significantly high power level. So like, um, you know, I'm 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 happy that uh, Outbreak uh, ended up having. A pretty, I mean, it was at the time basically one of the strongest primaries uh, in the game, and it just had this very unique effect, similar to like Rat King, or using it in conjunction with uh, other copies of itself would would kind of further increase that power level. So it still came out um, as a, as a draw to run the mission, kind of the same way that uh, uh, that um, uh, Whisper 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 uh, was. Dado, you have any other questions? Um, not really. I mean, like, this Zero Hours is so good as, like, a <laughs> piece of content. Like, normal mode, variant heroic mode, huge puzzle in the middle of it with, like, an extra cosmetic. The gun itself was really good. The catalyst was good. Like, it's a challenging piece of content. It's still a challenging piece of content to the point where, like, I still legitimately enjoy, you know, running fans and, and viewers through it to get their first outbreak and i don't know it's like i i almost like have nothing really negative to say about it as like just zero hour in a vacuum on its own that's a huge amount of praise like that's very humbling i i appreciate that it's it's uh, i mean it's, it's awesome. easily one of the best pieces of content in the game and i think if if niobe labs did not have the uh the, the two sort of iffy six and seven clues uh, that Niobe Labs would be um, right like, up there. It, it's basically, I mean, I, I'll, I'll just come out and say it. Niobe Labs is also one of the best pieces of content in the entire game. I'm also sad that that's going away um, yeah. because it is also a fascinating challenge from a combat perspective as well. And uh, I, I think goes underappreciated because they had that, you know, uh, the the sixth and seventh clue uh, issues that kind of stops people from progressing for a bit. But man, it, it's still even with the even with that, uh, I think it's one of the best pieces of content in the game uh, along with this. All right. Well, uh, I feel like the in the section of the maze here where we are cowering in fear of uh, Trevor is kind of the perfect place to end uh, this little this little foray into uh, <laughs> in, in, into Destiny stuff. Uh, Dado, thank you for coming on and uh, asking some questions and sure also thing. helping carry us through this content because I haven't Thanks. I haven't played in quite a while. <laughs> Thanks for inviting. Well, where me. can Same. where can people uh, find you? We we gonna do this? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right, youtube.com slash does destiny at Dado's destiny on Twitter and Dado on Twitch. I made it so it's really easy to find me because my name is different in every single location. Viper, thank you Yo. so much for uh, A, uh, helping, uh, being on the team that helped create some of the best content that has ever existed in Destiny. Of course. Uh, B, what are you up to? Where can people find you? Yeah, so since leaving Bungie, I went off to go start my own things, and I picked the worst possible time in COVID. <laughs> so they're kind of on hold right now, but I'm still working on them. I'm in the meantime doing a game design consultation, working on some mobile projects. Uh, but you can find me at Viper Zero, V Y P E R Z E R O. Um, at that on Twitter, and if you if you stay tuned to that and you like the stuff that I make, then uh, there's probably going to be some more cool stuff in the future uh, headed your way as a as a gamer. Mm, I see. Well, if you wanna if you wanna find him without trying to spell that out, uh, go to the description, click hey. click <laughs> click the links. Also, if you need to help find Datto, just Google Datto. It's 
it's the YouTuber, yeah, not fine, the right? not the search analytics company or whatever that is. Yeah, <laughs> not that, not the company from Connecticut. Yes. <laughs> thank thank you all for coming on, Dado Viper. Thank you for joining me. And uh, yeah, yeah, this is super neat. Uh, hope my pleasure. Yeah, hope everyone uh, enjoyed their time. Hope everyone learned something.